Greetings, everybody. Welcome to Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. My name is Ray, and I will be reviewing some current and classic Lit RPG audiobooks for you today. Uh, now, you may have recognized that I do like to theme out the shows whenever I can, uh, and today I do have a bit of a mixed bag. I'm going to focus on two collaborations and two musically themed books. Uh, so I can't really wait. Yeah, I, just, I love doing this sort of stuff. Uh, today, I'm starting with Song Maiden, A Little RPG Journey. Uh, it is the, the Uniworld Online Trilogy, book one. And I like that it's a trilogy. That is a plus in my book. They, they got to start, and they're going to have a finish. Can't go better than that. I love it. Um, it's written by Jonathan Brooks, uh, narrated by Annalise Rennie. Hey, hey. And has a book length of 7 hours and 14 minutes. No matter what test we had for her, she was always willing and eager to do whatever was needed. For her sake, don't treat this as a disability. Treat it as a unique trait that makes her special. Because she is special. I can already tell that she is highly intelligent and that it will probably grow even more pronounced as she grows older. I'm sorry that we don't have any more information for you. If you bring your daughter back in a couple of years, we can do some more tests that we weren't able to do yet due to her age. And maybe by that time, we will have further advanced our understanding of the human brain so that we might be able to help her out. Dr. Comaste finished his explanation. Eager to get out of there, Jane worked past her disappointment and thanked him. Scott shook his hand and thanked him profusely for working with their daughter. So, true confession time. Uh, this is a book that I was admittedly disappointed in as soon as I heard that Annalise Rennie wasn't lending her singing pipes to. I mean, she does a wicked carpenter imitation, if you want to know the truth of it. So I thought she was going to be cranking out some of the tunes that I could sing by as I listened. But alas, a lack and alas, that is not the case. But there's a good reason for it, and I'll explain that a little bit later. Now, overlooking that, I think that the book had some things going for it. And it also threw some stuff at us that was so far out of left field that it actually came from over the other side of the stadium walls. I mean, it was just it was just a weird uh, and out of the blue uh, stuff. So, I don't know. But anyway, th- this is, you know, I'm, I'm a bard person. And, you know, so today we're going to be getting a couple bard stories. And I, and I don't even think I mentioned this in the, the review that I do for it. Um, but we're going to be doing First Song, which is, you know, by Blaze Corbin and Alspian Foster. And that is about a guy who, who actually uses music in his head to perform, you know, magic. Here we get a girl, a mute girl, whose hippie parents settle down and kind of raise her with a love of music to a point where she can pretty much play Anything she lays her hands on, so long as it doesn't require her to blow into it. So, no piccolo solos for her. Sorry. Uh, on her first day at college, uh, things kind of go pear-shaped in a pretty horrific way for the poor girl. Uh, and she ends up hospitalized, unable to communicate since she can't use her hands to write with, since they kind of got smashed and crashed. Um so, you know, she's kind of screwed. Uh, her bestie, her best friend, uh, who she's known for a number of years now, buys her like a VR set and a game to keep her occupied while she's in bed. And she goes in totally clueless as to what she is to do. She's never played video games before. Uh, so, you know, the cool beans aspect um, for her is that the, the game unexpectedly provides the girl Cadence with a voice of her own, one that she constructs on her own uh, by just meshing the sounds together until she kind of says, this is what I want my voice to sound like. Uh, and this is what allows her to speak, talk for the first time in her life. She enters the game and then proceeds to do everything the normal player wouldn't. What, what do you mean by that, Ray? Well, I mean, she befriends town folks instead of questing. You know, she talks to NPCs and hangs out with NPCs. She never bothers her to get a class. She never tries to level. Those things, they don't interest her. She just wants to talk to people. So, Cadence, the MC, basically just shoots the breeze more than she shoots bows just from her excitement of being able to talk for the first time. And to me... This was probably about as realistic as it gets. You know, if I had to say, if I couldn't speak and suddenly I had the power to speak, 
when I just sat quietly in a corner? I don't know. That's like saying, hey, Ray, you're going to wake up in the morning and you're going to be able to fly. Do you think I'm walking to the store? No. No, no, no. Do you think I'm walking to work? No. No, no, no. You know, do you think my feet are going to touch ground for probably the next 12 months? No. I'm putting on goggles and, a, and a, getting a leather jacket and I'm zipping through the friendly skies. Okay. And it's the same thing here. I mean, it, that was very realistically played, you know, uh, just because that's just what a, a person like that would do. You know, someone's been gagged since the day they were born and they're suddenly given the ability to speak and say something. And you think they're going to want to go around swinging a sword instead? You're you're really mistaken. I just don't think so. I don't think it would fit. You know, it just would not work. It would not. Uh, and and thankfully, it's not just like you know her talking about like how her day was. So I had some tea and crumpets the other morning, and tomorrow I'd like to have some butter and jam on my 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 rolls. No, it's not like that at all. It's it's very like how can I help you through this situation. Uh, kind of conversations, and then she goes and helps everybody she meets, which kind of does some stuff for her that she wasn't anticipating. Now, the book slowly, from that point, becomes a standard lit RPG, and I'm kind of sad about that, um, because there was a lot of a lot of potential that I think was overlooked with her disability. I think there was a lot of things that could have been done, but what happens is, is after she starts talking, it just kind of shifts gears and becomes a natural everyday lit RPG book. Not a bad one, not at all, but it, it, it could have been like really different. It could have taken a whole different, uh, direction and led you down a path that you hadn't been down before. Um, you know, like, like one aspect that I liked was cadence chooses to become a bard in spite of being a low charisma dwarf. Um, you know, it's not something that, you know, anybody would play if they were in their right mind. Um, but of course, and this is where I say it, she naturally manages to skirt the penalties of her new class. It becomes kind of OP to a degree later on, you know, as her charisma just skyrockets. Uh, that was my least favorite aspect uh, because it went from having this really great premise to becoming just a little predictable. Also, the reason we don't get Rennie singing is because Cadence uses her perfect voice recall uh, to imitate singers that fit the mood that she's in as she casts spells. And what does that mean? Well, see, when she first uh, enters the game and they, they say, oh, you can't speak, so we're going to give you this uh, device. It's going to be an attachment to your, your gaming system. Uh, and, and it will let you either use your own voice, let you make up a voice, or imitate voices. You just have to be able to hear it in your head and say, this is what I want. Well, she has perfect, you know, um, vocal recall of voices, which is really bizarre uh, to have that power. But who am I to argue with that? I mean, if I can't talk, I guess I'm going to notice certain things about how people speak, their tone, their intonation, their cadence, so on and so forth, and so I'd be able to do this. Uh, and especially if, if my parents are hippie musicians, um, I'm going to know all kinds of musical um, geniuses, and I'm going to be able to pull those people out in my mind. I can hear Janis Joplin right now going through my head. Uh, you know, I'm not going to sing it. I'm not going to sing, come on, you know, take another piece of my heart. I'm not going to do it. But um, it works because she would say like, okay, uh, I'm really pissed. So I'm going to do like, you know, uh, Henry Rollins or I'm going to do Ozzy Osbourne, Crazy Train here or something in her head. Now they don't sing those lyrics because they're copyrighted. Shh, they're copyrighted. So she can't, they can't use those lyrics for whatever, um, but they use the voice. So when she says, you know, I'm going to use, you know, Dolores O'Riordan from the Cranberries, I wish she would have. I really wish because I love Dolores and she's dead now and she's gone and I miss her a lot. Um, but just to give her, you know, or Stevie Nicks, the goddess, you know, she could have said Stevie Nicks because she is the goddess. Shirley Manson from Garbage, that would have been a good one, but I'm, I'm digressing. But anyway, um, she has this recall, so she matches the tone of her emotions to the voice, and it gives her even more power because it's so um, distinctive in her mind, and it, it really amps her up, so to speak. Uh, so, you know, that was why she couldn't do this because, um, you know, 
as she imitates these singers, you know, to fit the mood, it, it was fantastic, but she never felt like Karen Carpenter. And so, you know, Annalise just really couldn't just pop one and just do, you know, I'm going to do it Karen Carpenter. If they didn't say who it was, she probably could have pulled that out. And and most of the music was really just like, you know, they weren't long lyrics, just one or two lines. And, and I don't think you want to go, you know, home again, home again, jiggity jig, you know, go outside and kick the pig. That kind of a song. That's not really something you would want to really belt out as a, as a, as a lyric. Um, if you were narrating, it would just be like, just let's just say it and go, go with that. Um, and, 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 and that's wise. It's wise. I, I just can't blame anybody for not singing the, the lyrics to the songs that we did have. Um, so, you know, she couldn't do much because the lyrics weren't overly long and it wouldn't have worked as well. Now, one thing that I'm going to just say straight up that completely blew my mind was the love scene that came out of nowhere. And I mean, there was no road signs, no hints, no clues, no lights, no boats, no motor cars, not a single hint for me. Uh, because as I'm watching this, it was like, I'm going to go to sleep now in game, which I never understand that anyway. If I'm playing a game and I'm tired, I'm not going to fall asleep and sleep in the game. As a character, I'm going to log out and take a nap. Just saying, I wake up, and the next thing you know, boobs is in your face, and you're saying, yeah, I kind of like that. And the next thing you know, they're going at it. Now, up to that point, I was really thinking that this was a great book for my kids to listen to. I mean, um, Cadence is very helpful. She's kind. She's generous. She's innovative. Uh, she doesn't take crap. I mean, she stands up for herself. I'm no prude, okay? I'm really not. I'm not a prude. Uh, and lesbian scenes neither shock me nor do they offend me, but it kind of just came out of nowhere. I mean, it came out of nowhere. It did not feel organic. In fact, it felt shoehorned in. I almost felt like the, the story had been written, and then we came back to that point and slipped it in just, just so there could be a graphic sex scene. I don't know why. I, I don't know why. Um, it almost felt like Brooks just wanted to adult up his tail to maybe draw in some harem crowd people or something. I, I don't know. I'll even go one further. It would have been much more organic if it had been, you know, Cadence's best friend. That would have made perfect sense. If her friend had joined the game and come into it, and then the next thing you know, uh, there's this unrequited love that, you know, that Cadence didn't know was there for, for years and years. Uh, suddenly it manifests. That I would have understood at the very least. This is with people that she barely knows, barely knows, and it just it did not feel like it belonged. I don't know how to say it any other way. It, it was strange, and it's and it's one of those things where I don't I don't fast forward, uh, and I don't recommend people do that sort of thing. I mean, if you're listening to a book or you're reading a book, read the book. But I know people that do fast forward, and if you want to, go ahead. Uh, but I, I listened to it and, and it's, like I said, I've listened to Planet Kill and I've listened to Gunmeister Online and, and those books are pretty graphic and I'm not stunned or shocked and I, I didn't bleed from my ears from the stuff that happened. Um, and this wasn't to that degree, but it still just did not feel right for me for this, the story. It just, it was weird. Uh, and I don't mean to belabor this point, but it just really, you can see it just kind of knocked me out of my body when it happened. Um, I just didn't know where it came from or why it was there. And I still don't. I still don't. Uh, I just don't know what happened. Uh, now, thankfully, the one thing I will say that was really good for this, um, Cadence did not moon over the encounter chapter after cha chapter like I expected her to do. I mean, she kind of just says, yeah, it happened. And if it happens again, whatever. But it wasn't like she just kept thinking about the person and and wondering what was going to come next and you know what was going to happen where they going to blossom and this romance none of that none of that came out so that was good. Now Rennie does a really great job here and she adds a lot of emotional credence to Cadence's struggles. Uh, you can feel her pain from the emotional barrage that she gets from her professor to the physical pain that she endures that puts her into the hospital. Now I will say that the bonds of credulity were stretched a little bit at the end when it's revealed just who attacked her. 
okay, Cadence. But even then, Rennie plays it smooth and carries the story like a champ. She's never let me down as a narrator, and I know she has the goods to deliver a great tale. She does that here. Uh, you know, she seemed very nonplussed when uh, the sex scene came up, and she read it just like it was having. She was having fun with it. That's what you're supposed to do. I never felt like she felt uncomfortable. Uh, I never felt, you know, that. She, I mean, she was just, she, she read the story. She enjoyed the story. She had fun with the story. She really seemed to like being Cadence. And, and that is the, the key for me. You know, when you, when you like your story, it's very important that you like your story. Um, and she did. She enjoyed the story. You know, she's never let me down and she's always given me a good tale. Um, so kudos to her. My final score is going to be a bit wonky. Now I'm, I'm going to tell you why. Um, as I listened to this, I had planned on an 8.2, but then the sex scene and the overdone villain reveal, and this, this I have to say, the overdone villain reveal really is what took this down quite a few pegs. I mean, I would have just taken off like two points for the, the out of the blue sex scene that did not fit and just said, yeah, this is an eight and let it be. But uh, you just have to realize that the, the 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 villains it's just very trite just very trite in making the attackers who they were uh the odds of it even being possible that it was these people are so astronomical that it, it's actually a little insulting to me that brooks assumes that we would even believe it becoming close to being possible uh because it's not it it, it is there's a game, and let's just say it's like, wow, let's just tone it down a little bit. There's only a million people that play the game every day. A million. And if the people who attacked her actually played the game, the odds of her them being in the same vicinity when she loads in are going to be abysmal. And the odds that she would meet them in any kind of circumstances or way is even more abysmal. Uh, I mean, like, you're talking like she should have hit, like, the billion-dollar lottery eight times before this would have happened. Then she'd have got hit by lightning, attacked by a shark on land, uh, and then fallen into a sinkhole uh, that was filled with bubble gum at the bottom. That's how unlikely that is to me to have happened. And, I, and that really kind of insulted me that, you know, he thought I would be that dim, that obtuse to not say, really, really, it could have been anybody or any other thing, and, and this is what you decided to do. Uh, so I had to take it down some more. I, I really did. Uh, and I'm being really nice here because this was, my, my, my incredulity levels were stretched to infinity and beyond. I'm going to buzz light your, your ass. Uh, it really drove me. I just, I'm swearing a lot lately on this, this episode, um, because it was just so unbelievable to me. It just knocked me out the way that it was set up. Um, so I'm going to say 7.9 could have been higher, but stuff happens and sometimes it shouldn't. And there were two things that shouldn't have happened. The, the sex scene to me should have just been left out and the big villain reveal for who attacked her just should never have happened it should have been somebody totally unrelated and had maybe find another way to, to weave it in but for for it to be them it just, no no i didn't buy it so i'm sorry 7.9 stars it's still a really good story it's still interesting um and like i say it just the only thing i, I really think is it, it just went from being like this really great premise to being a traditional lit RPG. And uh, traditional lit RPGs, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but it had like a lot more potential. And maybe in book two, we'll see some of that potential really kind of come forth. So I look forward to it because I will be listening to book two. Okay, so the next book I'm doing is Civil War. Yeah, The Rogue Dungeon. Uh, you were thinking I was going to do like a Marvel superhero audio book today, Civil War? No, no. Um, this is book two of The Rogue Dungeon, uh, written by James Hunter and Eden, with a small e, uh, Hudson, narrated by Nick Padell, uh, and the book length of 11 hours and 20 minutes. The mist-veiled graveyard was silent 
when Scott Bayani, in the form of his main, Poner Boner OG, crept through the rows of run-down tombs toward the outer wall of the cruel citadel. Under normal circumstances, this place was overrun with shambling revenants. Tonight, though, their bodies lay around the gravestones, over top vaults, and hanging halfway out of mausoleum doors. Somebody else's party must have come through and wiped out these low-level mobs while he was respawning. Good news for him. Scott didn't have time to waste on shambling revenants. At 10.30, he had to be at Taco Bell for the munchies shift, serving up reheated chalupas and floppy tacos to stoners. The Wonder Twin rejects Kevin and Kelly, better known as Dude Farkowitz and Rogstar Kel when they were playing their alts, had already logged out for the night out of frustration after the failed raid. Well, screw them both sideways and upside down. Poner Boner OG didn't run away crying like a baby when he died. So Rourke finally returns uh, in a wonderfully penned tale about his struggle to gain dominance in his dungeon. Uh, and that is what the Civil War refers to, in case you were thinking that it was going to have Iron Man or Captain America show up somewhere along the lines, which I'm very sad to say they don't. Uh, but we do get some really good Cooter Joe and Poner Boner. Uh, they're back for more. So that's a plus. I have to say that Poner Boner is probably my favorite jerks of all time. Uh, I really just love the guy. He, he's a total beehole. Uh, but he's fun. He's fun to watch get pissed. And he's fun to see how he is going to try to retaliate uh, for his imagined slights. I don't know if they're really imagined at this point because I, I think that, you know, Rorick does kind of go out of his way to, to, to zip the dude. Um, but like I say, um, the, the dungeon is embroiled in an uncivilized war. And Rorick is beset on quite a few fronts as he has to fend off player incursions, assaults from unfriendlies, uh, from the lower levels, uh, and even some dev concerns he's not aware about. That's right, developers come into this this uh, book play a little bit here. Uh, so he's got some issues going on. Uh, and, and that is one thing that I think is so slick about the series, is that it meshes not one, not two, but three. Count them, three. Uh, different worlds or dimensions together. Rorik's world, the game world, and the player's world. You know, they all kind of meld and come together in some way. It's, it, and it, it, it works. It works really well. Uh, now, the addition, this edition of the series picks up a lot of steam. Okay, it does. It starts picking up a lot of steam. Uh, book one had a great intro and setup, but this... This is where the steam starts picking up because things take off in this book. Uh, we get bigger fights, more evolutions, and alliances from different floors. Uh, my madman Kaz, he tears up as a master chef. And Zira, which I would love to believe that she is named after the awesome, awesome ape wife of on Planet of the Apes. Uh, Zero has always been Zero was always one of my favorite uh, apes from Planet of the Apes, and I'm hoping that's where that name comes from. Uh, Zero takes to kicking ass like nobody's business. She takes it to a whole new level. Uh, I would love to see a reference to Cass be kind of becoming an Iron Chef. Uh, I would love, you know, he gets this really cool meat tenderizer, so to speak. Um, but I think he needs a good cleaver and sharpening tool uh, in his pantry. So they can pull those down and start really going to town on some people. Uh, we also get to see some crafting. So fans of this portion of gaming will be quite happy, uh, as will the builders, as Rorik does go on and reconfigure his level several times. There was also an addition of some NPC trainers who are actually very interesting. They're fun. And Kaz even gets a love interest. Okay, so the only part of the book that I struggle with is the burgeoning romantic vibes that I get not from Kaz, but from Rourke and Zira. Uh, this is not a happy thing. Uh, Zira, if you think about it, is a complete monster that loves blood and killing. Rourke really only kills in this world because he has no choice and he wants to save his people, so he has to get more powerful. If he didn't have to kill the players... He would never bother with them. He wouldn't take a life unless he had to protect himself. Um, Zira, not so much. I think she she if she doesn't kill three people before she gets out of bed, she's not happy, you know? Uh, so, you know, once this whole battle thing is done and Rorik can go home after he's 
killed the bad guy and he's done everything he can. Um, there, there's going to be issues because he's either going to have to leave her behind because he can't take her with him once he's human again. She's still a monster. She's a troll. And she's a huge monster. Uh, it's not like she's even a human-sized monster anymore. She would, like, you know, uh, I don't know how do you out-tall somebody. Uh, how do you say that? Uh, she's going to be a lot bigger than him uh, as him being a human. Uh, that it just wouldn't work to start with. Um, and if she becomes human, I doubt that she's not going to want to go around killing people all day. Because that's pretty much what she lives and breathes for. Um she loves to kill. She loves to sneak and attack. Sneak and attack. You know, that's just her MO, her method of operation. And uh, as much as I wish I, I didn't see Rorik, you know, loving his life as a troll, you know, I, I think he could. I think he could live it. But I, I don't think that that's his plan. I think he wants to go back and become who he was. Um, he, I could be wrong. He could stay there and be like, you know what, Zira? Uh, you're the woman for me, and I don't care if I never become who I was. I'm somebody new and better now. I'm sticking around. That will be it. That's the only way you're going to any kind. You're going to get any kind of a positive resolution from this romance because she can't become human. He has to stay a monster. There's no way around it. Um, and he's never once, if you think about it, never once mentioned how much better it is being a troll than it is to have been a human. So problems. Uh, either way, I've gotten you know I've got to put points. I've got to put points to Eden Hudson and Hunter towards doing the right thing. I mean they have a plan, uh, and I trust in them. I really do. I trust in them to take care of business. But I'm just pointing this out because I can see issues. I can see issues. Um, I will reiterate that I'm always amazed, as I said before, how well James manages to meld his writing style with that of whomever he partners with. In so flawless a manner, the writing here is flawless, it's smooth, and it's well-paced. The action picks up, and it never really lets up. The characterizations are well done, and I have to say that as much as I like my beefy chef, Zira has stolen my cholesterol-clogged heart. Uh, I think I like her more than Rorik, I mean, but then kick-butt assassin chicks have always been my weakness. Ma'am, actually, if I'm going to be honest with you, I'm attracted to crazy more than I am to kick buddiness, but um, we'll leave my personal life and my wife out of this discussion. So thank you. Uh, but yeah, crazy and me, we we go like this. We go like this. Um, now, what can I say um, about Nick Padel? What haven't I said already? I mean, he plays a series like he was in the World Series of Poker, holding four aces on every hand. He pones it. <laughs> See what I did there? And prop guy. He ain't around, so he can suck it. Um, anyway, Nick really makes this super duper fun. And while I think that his weakest point as a narrator is that he can't do a dozen different female voices, like if you listen to S Super Sales on Superheroes or Secret Sales on Super, uh, the, the William Moran book, Super Sales on Superheroes, um, the, my biggest problem was is you know his lady voices. There's too many women, and he can't be super distinctive for each of them to stand out. It was really hard for me to point out who somebody was as they spoke. Here, he doesn't have that problem because there's not a dozen women that he has to voice. Uh, and the ones that he does do work really well here and are very distinctive unto themselves. And I kind of boxed myself in with my review of the first book because I think, if I remember correctly, I think it hit at like an 8.5. And I loved this book. You know, it's it's better. But it's hard for me to just say, okay, well, this is, the first book was 8.5, so this book is this. I mean, it, it's tough because I, I have had a lot of uh, Hunter's books that have improved every single time. Uh, you know, I love Viridian Gate, and I love War God, so I can't just say 8.5 again because this is improved. Um but for me, like nine points is like the highest I could possibly give out 90% of the time, maybe 99% of the time, because nine points is like this is just about as good as it could possibly get. Um, so you really got to approach perfection for me to go past like the 8.5 part. Um, and like I said, the, the story, the characters, uh, it's interesting. It's fun. I enjoyed it. I didn't want to want it to stop. Um and I will say that we do get more 
Uh, we get about three hours more uh, of the story this time than we did before. And, and I'm honestly, I'm, I'll be frank with you, I'm beginning to get to a point where I'm about, uh, a book should be about eight hours long, um, you know, audio book, uh, just because it, it can it can be really overwhelming sometimes to get like a 19-hour book or a 20-hour book or 24-hour book. I used to love it because that was like um, something I could listen to for a while. Now I've got to struggle to get through, you know, several books a week. Uh, you know, I don't try to short you guys. I want to do at least three to four books every episode. You know, Ramon can read like, like honestly, if I was reading it, I could probably do 10 books a week because my reading speed is really great and my retention for reading is fantastic. Um, my listening skills and retention is bad. So I've got to like listen and then review quickly because I won't remember what happened in the story if I don't, unless it's like a really incredible story. So for like the, the cruddier stories, it makes it hard for me to come to a conclusion on what to do. So I have to like do things quickly. So I don't know. I'm, I'm beginning to wonder, is, is it better to have like, you know, snippet style books or, you know, really long style for me, I'm, I'm finding I'm gravitating more and more, <clears throat> towards less than 10 hours at a stretch is where I like to be at. Uh, but that doesn't mean I'm going to stop anything. I'm just going to keep going. But right here, my final score for this, after a lot of, of thinking about it, I have to say like 8.7 stars. This was a phenomenal story. Uh, and, I, and I know that James Hunter went back and changed the ending of his, the, the, the original ending of the story. I don't know what it was about, what it was like, why he felt it had to be changed. But whatever he did, he did it the right way the second time because the story really works well. Um, the only thing that I think that uh, he kind of he hints at, but he doesn't give you much to go on, and I'm sure it's going to play into the next book, is uh, the character that came over from Rorik's world that had been in the game before and ta has taken over his own dungeon. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so, you know, now Rorik has that to deal with where there's, you know, one of his enemies from his own world in the game world, and they've taken over a complete dungeon unto themselves already. So that's just barely touched upon, and I can't wait to see more of it. Um, but that's like the only thing I think that he didn't really do. And he crammed in a lot of stuff to start with. So to put in more, it would have just been overwhelming, I think. And it would have detracted from the story. And I'm hoping that's all he did was just kind of cut some of that stuff out because there's so much more in the story already. I didn't really need to have that for the most part. I think he worked it pretty well saying, here's a clue as to what's happening and we'll see it next time. So, 8.7 because it is phenomenal. It was very enjoyable, and I think you'll like it a lot. All right, so my next book that I'm reviewing is called First Song, Anthem of Infinity, Series Book 1, by ooh, 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 Blaze Corvin, Outspan Foster. You might know him by another name if you're in the forums a little bit. Narrated by Ramon Diocampo, with a book length of 12 hours and 9 minutes. Noah felt a burning need to yell, to shout a warning to a small group of surrounded travelers. But as usual, he couldn't find his voice. Then the tired old guilt set in, familiar self-loathing. He was a coward, his mind drowning in fear. Hints of a red banner flying in the deep woods past his open clearing gave him a good idea of what was happening. A hand pressed on his shoulder with a decent amount of force, and no one knew what the signal meant. Combined with a whistle, it meant one thing. Down. He fell to the cushioning grass like a sack of potatoes, then turned to the owner of the hand. Yusuf gave him a weary smile. I don't think Allah will count this as one of my five prayers for the day. The, the red chain, Noah managed to whisper. He noticed the others in the group were down low in the high grass as well. It had been two years since the shift, when all the electronics and technology in the world had largely become useless. So, uh, I have to say, this was like a really, really weird book for me. In fact, I kind of think it was 
a first for me. Uh, I'm always going to be truthful and, uh, about things, and I have to admit that when I first started this book, I really was not a fan. The writing was really good, but I really hated the entire apocalyptic setting. The main character, he, he just pretty much lived out the embodiment of the name Worm that he is given by some raiders, and he really was not someone that I cared about. Uh, actually, I hoped he died. I hoped he'd die quite a few times, and I actually thought that he would, would very clearly, because there was no way that Worm was the dude that's on the book's cover. Now, I enjoy Bleak. I, can, I, I love apocalypses. You know, Mad Max is like a walk in the park on Sunday with, you know, looking at the flowers for me. Um, but I don't enjoy weak and whiny, and that's what Worm was. He was a total punk. So, I don't want to hit you with any spoilers, but I will say that the book makes for a huge change part of the way in. And that, my friends, is where the worm turns. Really? Really? That's what you're going with? You were in a perfectly good prop setup for a dumbass joke? Put it in here. Put it in here. Right now. The worm turns. Thank you, prop guy. All right, so... Anyway, I've been chastised. Worm sort of then becomes Noah, uh, the guy that he should have been all along. And in that one instance, the entire tone of the book shifts. Worm dries up in the sun, and Noah takes his place. See, I slipped that worm joke in on him. He didn't see it. <laughs> so, um, anyway, uh, Noah is a, a take-no-BS kind of guy. He sets up taking care of business. Uh, see, he can do things to prevent the events that created Worm and crushed humanity in a punked out apocalypse from being quite so harsh because of a little thing called, uh, uh, well, uh, spoilers, can't do it. Um, there might be a clue here, I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, Noah very calculatingly implements a 20-year-long plan to kind of help prep and prepare for an invasion of these alien beings called the Elves, which is like elves with an A, uh, and they are kind of like mythical elves in appearance, but they're, you know, stronger, faster, tougher uh, than humans. They can perform magic, and blessings among blessings, they love to eat people. So, you know, they're baddies all around. Compared to us, they're, they're hardcore, they, and they're cannibalistic. Well, they're not cannibalistic, they don't eat themselves, I don't think. Uh, but they do love to eat humans. So, you know, that, that's a downer for us, anyway. Um, and I have to say that the, the building aspect is really what I loved a lot about this book. You know, I'm, I'm always the one saying, like, Tamer is one of those books where I love it because I get to see him build his little fortress. And, you know, that's just one of those things where they talk about creating new medieval-style weapons and that sort of stuff. It turns this book in, into a very quickly interesting story where before it was kind of like run-of-the-mill. And I don't know if that was intentional, where they say, let's just do this. It's going to look like every other book that was ever written in this style beforehand. And then we're going to flip it around and do all this other stuff, which is more gaming related, uh, or not. I don't know. I don't know if it was just like, well, this is what we want, and then we're going to go into this. But it was very, very slick on how it worked, because um, I think the, the planning, the prep, the sacrifice, that stuff I'm a sucker for, and I loved it. Uh, but for me, my favorite part of the book was the scheming baby, and you'll know it when you get there. That's all I can tell you. That was just the best, just the best. Um, when we finally return to the apocalypse, I found myself looking forward to it coming. I, I really anticipated it. I said, yeah, yeah, let's bring it on. Bring on those elves. I want to see what happens now, you know. Uh, so it was, it was really, it was a fun, fun thing that I was waiting for. Whereas before, I kind of was like, oh, can we just kill this guy and get out of this somehow? Uh, and thankfully, um, you know, when that was on the book at third gear, you know, and, and and started moving because there was actually a point even with the town building and the and the medieval weapons stuff uh, that the book really needed some action. It really did uh, because you know uh, the main character getting chased through town by a basketball player just was not as exciting as you know fighting space elves. 
Okay. Um, so, so while the book might have started off a little slow with an unlikable character, for me anyway, I have to say that I, I really don't believe that we were ever supposed to like Worm. Sympathize? Yeah, but not like. And, and I didn't sympathize with him anyway. He was cowardly. He did some really reprehensible stuff, uh, like going along the slave trade, for example. So I had no empathy for the dude whatsoever. But once he transformed himself from a spineless wimp into the determined Noah that he became, I was cheering for him all the way. Uh, the elves uh, seem to make some pretty good villains. I highly anticipate more of them in book two. Uh, Noah has a bond with one of the higher-ups now, uh, and he's going to have to deal with that at some point. So Corvin and Foster do like a really admirable job here of teaming up to do this piece of writing. Now, I know generally I praise James Hunter about how well he meshes his writing with his partners so flawlessly, but I have to say that the pair here did a pretty seamless job as well, and that I would be hard-pressed, very hard-pressed, to pick out who did what or whose voice it was that we were really hearing. I honestly, th honestly think that Corvin gave Foster his head. He just said, you go ahead, you go crazy, do what you think, and I'll try to reel you in if you get out too far, which I don't think Foster did. And, you know, and if that's the case, it was a pretty wise move. It totally worked. And it is really awesome to see a collaboration come together as well as this. Now, um, the ebook, I'm going to just say this really quickly. Um, it's one thing for the ebook, for the audio book. There's like this, this whole Blaze Corbin outspan Foster. And, you know, I know you are outspan. I just don't, I won't out you on this. Um, love fest between the two. Like they write like, Blaze Corvin was the greatest guy ever, and I met him back when. And then Blaze says, and Outspan Foster is just the most awesomest dude. And then and Outspan says, and Blaze Corvin really is the most awesomest dude. And it goes back and forth like that, like four times. And, and that's great for the ebook. I really didn't need it for the Audible. Um, to me, Audible is like turning on the TV uh, or flicking on a movie. I, I don't want to sit down and turn a movie on HBO and have 10 minutes of previews like I was in a theater. Um, and, and in an ebook, I know I can skip that right away if I don't want to read it. And I usually do. But for me in the Audible, that, that's like something that should come to the end of the book. Really, you should flip that and put that to the end because I want to get right into the story. And, and you know, it's great to have authors who love each other and respect each other and admire each other. And I really mean that very sincerely. Uh, but I did not need like uh, the four pages or whatever it was of how great each other were to work with because it's very evident in the writing that you do together how great it was for you two to work as a team. Um, Ramon Diocampo's narration it took me a little while to get used to. Uh, he was new to me, and I had to settle in and really listen. And I have to say that he grew on me the longer we went. And I don't know if that's because I really was not liking Worm, uh, or if it was him that I just had to grow into. And I think it was more the Worm factor, uh, because I just did not love Worm at all. And I, I think that no matter who was reading, it could have been Luke Daniels or Jeff Hayes or Nick Podell or... Justin Thomas James, or it could have been, you know, Andrea Parsnow, you know, or Annalise Rennie. Uh, any of those people could have done, been doing the reading, and I'd probably said the same thing. It took me a little while to get used to him. I just didn't know him. Uh, and so I would probably say that the first part of the book, no matter what they did, it just kind of yeah, got me. But I think that's just how they want you to perceive the guy. Uh, but again, like I said, I just wanted him to die. I had no, never, ever did I want him to succeed or survive, I was like, this guy needs to go give that thing to somebody else so that they can do better. And that's what I thought was going to happen uh, because it would have been a pretty good surprise to see that. It had been like in Scream. You know, you got Drew Barrymore, great big name, and then you kill her 10 minutes into the flick. I'd have said, even if it was 10% of the book, Worm dies and somebody else, great, great. That worked out really well. Now, everyone with Diocampo stood out as an individual character. I never wondered who was speaking, ever. Uh, and, and that would have really made them stand out to me. I'm sorry. <sighs> they really stood out to me very well as individuals. I knew who each character was at any given point just by the way they spoke or their cadence of speaking. The only thing, and I say this very, very sincerely, the only thing that I wish he had done was to give the elves some kind of an accent. Um, 
much in the way that dwarves are Scottish sounding, even though I hate that trope. I mean, seriously, every dwarf in every book sounds Scottish. I don't care if it's because the Lord of the Rings has it. Not every single dwarf needs to sound like they're from Scotland. Just the way I feel about it. It drives me crazy. And it's not just one narrator that does it. It's all narrators that I seem to find that do that. Either they're either 100% Scottish or they're just plain English and there's nothing in between uh, to give them any kind of flavor. And I kept going back, because these, these are aliens, so I kept going back to one of my favorite sci-fi shows and thinking of Londo Malari from Babylon 5. Uh, Peter Jurassic worked so hard to create this distinctive accent for his race, his people with this Atari. And, and then every single actor that came onto the show that played a Centauri, never used that awesome accent. It drove me batshit. Okay, just straight up drove me crazy because here you get this really awesome accent that this dude is working, he is making it happen, and then no one even tries, not even tries to come close to doing that accent. Great accent. Here, I would have liked to have heard some sort of a tinge to their voice just so I would know it was an elf speaking before they said it was an elf, uh, or elf, or however you want to say it. Um, it. It's just one of those things, I think it would have really, really helped uh, accentuate the story just that much more. It would have made it more stand out, uh, stand outish, stand about, stand up, stand up, stand in the place that you work. That's, okay, anyway, um, it would have just been that much better. And, and I can't fault him for not doing that. I'm just saying, if it were me, I would have tried to give them something to make them sound more alien than not. But again, that's just, just the way I'm, I'm thinking about it. Overall, even though, even, even though I was not a fan of the first part of the book, just because I did not like Worm, I think that it worked. It worked in making me hate him because I liked him a lot by the end of the book, and I anticipated things happening. I wanted the apocalypse to come because now... Noah was prepared. You know, Worm became Noah. Noah is prepared for the elves. I, I don't want to tell you why or how. There's a lot of stuff that goes on, but it, it was just great. And now, now for book two, I actually want to see this post-apocalyptic wasteland. Well, it wasn't a wasteland, but let's just say this post-apocalyptic world where humans are in the decline, and they're on the menu at McStarbucks in space or whatever it is um, for these elves. So, you know, it, it was a big shift because I really, as I was listening to this, I was like, oh my God, I love Blaze Corbin. And, and you know, Outspan, he's a rocking dude, and I've talked to him a few times. Um, he's really awesome to me about things and advice and, and whatever. And I kept going, I just, I hate to even have to say I'm going to have to give a horrible review for this book because I'm not enjoying it and I, and I cannot not talk to you about this. And then it shifted so subtly and ma magnificently, I was going to say malignantly, but it wasn't malignant at all, um, magnificently that um, I was just blown away by how quickly the book shifted tone and, and, and pacing and style and I was like, wow, this is just amazing. Um, so I look forward to it. I really look forward to this new world with Noah at the helm. I want to see what comes next. I think you will too. My final score, 8.5. I can't ask for more, honestly. Um, it would, if I didn't hate, 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 hate the first half of the book, or not half, but for whatever part of this, up until Worm gets wanked, um, I probably would have given it a higher score. Um, and as much as I know that it was kind of like we had to set up who he was, I just did not enjoy reading Worm one bit, not one second. Uh, so I had to knock it down a bit. But I think 8.5 is a damn good score. All right. All right. The next thing I'm going to be doing is actually a What Else Have They Done by Luke Daniels. Luke Daniels. All right, Luke. How you doing, man? Yeah. Uh, what I'm going to be reviewing uh, for Luke, and I think it's a, a, it's a well-deserved and it's long time coming, um, and it's going to be book one of uh, the Iron Druid Chronicles. It's called Hounded. It's written by Kevin Hearn and narrated by, of course, as I've said before, Luke Daniels, and it has a book length of eight hours and six minutes. I try to settle in places they can't reach very easily. 
They have all sorts of gateways to earth in the old world, but in the new world, they need oak, ash, and thorn to make the journey. And those trees don't grow together too often in Arizona. I have found a couple of likely places, like the White Mountains near the border with New Mexico and a riparian area near Tucson. But those are both over a hundred miles away from my well-paved neighborhood near the university in Tempe. I figured the chances of the Fey entering the world there and then crossing a treeless desert to look for a rogue druid were extremely small. So when I found this place in the late 90s, I decided to stay until the locals grew suspicious. It was a great decision for more than a decade. I set up a new identity, leased some shop space, hung out a sign that said Third Eye Books and Herbs, an allusion to Vedic and Buddhist beliefs because I thought a Celtic name would bring up a red flag to those searching for me, and bought a small house within easy biking distance. So, as a fan of urban fantasy, I really could not help but bring this book into this review segment. Uh, it is really a great vehicle for Luke Daniels. I would absolutely call this his signature series. Even above all the other lit RPG novels that he's rocked out so hard, like Advent and Ascend Online, Magic 2.0, and even Tamer. Uh, and, and, you know, he's got like a boatload of books to his name. I mean, if you, you look at him, there is just untold novels that he has, he has lent his voice to. Uh, it's It's scary. But this, I think this is his series. I think that years from now, people are going to look back and go, what did Luke Daniels do? And they're going to say, Iron Druid. Iron Druid, that there's no question about it. This is the, the story that was his. He made this amazing. As good as it was on, on paper, he took this and transformed it into a pyramid rather than you know, a house of cards. He, he killed this. Totally killed this. Uh, the character, the setting, the conflict, all combined to a zeitgeist for modern Celtic mythology. Yeah, I'm going to pull my Irish card here. Uh, this is getting close to St. Patrick's Day. I've got a lot of ancestral pride. We just had shepherd's pie today for dinner. Uh, we had Irish food yesterday. We're going to have seven days of Irish dinners and things like that. So in my house, we celebrate Ireland, like it should be celebrated. If, if I drank, I'd be, you know, chugging beers. Uh, but <clears throat> I also have to say, I'm really happy to get a, a Celtic story, a, you know, a hero who's Celtic that doesn't have, you know, Brian Baru or Ku Kalan, you know, Ku Cullen um, as the star of the book. You know, normally, you know, Ku Kalane is like the, the guy that they talk about, Brian Baru. It's kind of like, you know, with Scotland, William Wallace, but William Wallace was a real guy. But if you're going to go to mythology, like Brian Baru is like the Irish cat, you know what I'm talking about? So <clears throat> basically, the Iron Druid, it, it, it always pushed me off. There, was, there were several reasons why I never picked this series up for a long time. And the first, and the very first and foremost thing, was the name the Iron Druid. Um, and I really thought it was going to be, and I, I hate to sound like I'm stupid, but it was going to be like a, a magic user who um, worked with metals. You know, I mean, that's just that's just what it sounds like to me, the Iron Druid. Um, and that's not the case. Um, but the story starts off with 21-year-old bookshop uh, shop owner Atticus Sullivan having a nice, quiet day. Uh, the, the truth is, he's 21 centuries old, yeah, he's hiding out in Arizona because of a centuries-long ownership dispute over a magical sword. Atticus wants to keep his head down and to stay out of trouble, but his ancient rival, an old Celtic god, has discovered him, and things go sideways rather fast from that point. Now, there are tons of sword fights and you know, dog fights and magic and gods and, you know, mystical creatures to make you just want to pray for a movie to come along. This this book screams movie to me. Uh, just it, It's awesome. The series, now not just book one, it's just, it's just that good. Uh, plus, it is infused with humor throughout, but it does not, and this is very important, it does not try to be funny. The humor is organic and comes really naturally. Really naturally. The story is not only an excellent introduction, you know, for the series, but it sets up a lot of what is to come as Atticus deals with the Morrigan, which is like a goddess of death, werewolves, vampires, all of whom are ostensibly his allies. Uh, for me, the best part of the series is Atticus's 
the loyal Irish wolfhound Oberon. And I will say, I think Hearn really knows how to mesh the ancient with the urban. Yep, ancient stuff with urban stuff. He nails it. He keeps the tale fluid, exciting, and nail-biting. Nail-biting. Um, it is Daniels, however, and I'm going to just say this like this. It is Daniels that brings this story to life. Like I said, my favorite thing about the book is Oberon, the dog. I could listen to Daniels' voice of that character all day long. It's funny. It's effective. It's it's heart wrenching at times. It's very sincere. Um, he doesn't try to pull like a Scooby Dooby Doo or a Rastro voice. You know, um, he makes the dog sound smart and excited, but still sound like a dog. You know, gee, Atticus, I can't even I can't even do the voice, but uh, you know, I would like to get some bacon today. You know, that I, I, I'm I'm not even gonna try. I used to be able to do it really well, but I can't do it anymore. Um, so I mean, I I can't. I don't know. I just I can't say. Anything more because I fully credit his portrayal of Oberon as the reason that Oberon became popular enough to warrant his own short story about the dog and a squirrel. Uh, how many times have I said Oberon in this paragraph? I mean, that's it's kind of ridiculous. Oberon, Oberon, over I, I, four or five times. That's a lot of Oberons. But Obi is is really a special special animal. And believe me, when you hear him talk. You will believe it's a dog talking. I'm not talking like, uh, you know, uh, you know the, the the maple kind. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, I'm not talking like that kind of dog. You know those those little commercials where the guy talks about like he got a steak and he gave the cat to, that that stuff. That, that's a good voice, but um, this really packs it. It packs this huge punch, and it, it just makes you laugh, and it, sometimes it makes you cry because he he just drips sincerity. Um, now, Daniels does his pretty much standard Daniels voice as he plays Atticus, which is great, which is great because, you know, he, he's playing the main character. And why would you strain yourself with somebody who's going to be doing 90 percent of the speaking in the book? You you know, don't go out of your way to make things more difficult for yourself. So Atticus is there. But he, he also plays like a great Viking vampire, a werewolf attorney. He does a great job playing a sexy bartender as Atticus's at Atticus's favorite restaurant. And he even pulls off a ghostly female Hindu witch. I'll try saying that four times real fast. I mean, seriously, there is a reason that this guy plays in the major leagues. There's a reason why he's got a list of books longer than my arm. Okay? He's pretty hardcore. Um, without a doubt, he's one of my top narrators. And there's a reason for that. He's very, very skilled. I mean, the guy is just incredible. Now, the series is great early on, but I have to warn you, towards the end... Towards the end, i.e. maybe the last three books or so, it does kind of become a little preachy about the environment. Uh, or, you know, I, I don't want to say it's over the top, but it might be for some people. Um, I try to take things with a grain of salt most times, and I, I don't let it bother me too much, but I, even I thought it was a little preachy. Just a little bit. Still, all the elements are there for a great urban fantasy, and I have to say this is probably one of the best-known UF titles after the Dresden Files. I mean, you might argue Shane Silver's, uh, you know, but to me, this is in the same category as Dresden. It's almost, Dresden's like all the way up here, and then, you you know, everything else is just kind of scrambling to touch it. Um, and, and I'm really, as much as I hate to say this, as much as I love Dresden, um, I'm, I'm pretty much sick of waiting for him to produce, you know, years and years and years and years for a story to come out it really just, it's it's a spit in the eye of, of your readers when you keep saying, well, I've got all these excuses for this happening. And I understand that, you know, things happen. But you, you kind of can't keep up the momentum of a story with a huge gap in time. And I'm not talking like George R. R. Martin time, but it's pretty darn close. Uh, and I know he's got something coming out this year so so far, supposedly. I'll wait and see. But that alone, you see, Hearn... Hearn actually finished the series. That's a, that's another plus. He finished. He closed the book. Boom. Closed it on Atticus. He closed it. Then he moved on to a new, seri new series, and the first book is called Kill the Farm Boy. So, you know, Iron Drew would start to finish. It's done. Now, he didn't do 17 books so far. He did, you know, less than 10, but it was manageable. He... he he did exactly what he should have. 
He told a story, and he completed the story. Hurrah, huzzah, hullabalah, whatever. You get my picture. He was able to actually give you an opportunity to go in, have a great deal of fun, and finish within a short period of time. I mean, believe me, once you get the first book, you're going to get the second, and then the third, and then the fourth. And before you know it, you're going to be like, I, I need my fix. You know, I, I need my Atticus. Where, where is my Atticus? And, and, and that's the way it'll be. Um, you know, and that's how people are with Dresden overall, but there's no sucker. I mean, there's no nothing uh, to kind of make you sustain yourself. Uh, and here, you don't have that worry. It's, it's, it's started and completed before you even get into it if you haven't read it yet. So, you know, I, I said earlier, um, one of the reasons why I didn't get this book for a long time, and, and I'll tell you the only flaw that I really see in the whole series is that the book covers themselves, the book covers look like cheap knockoffs from a failed supernatural as in the CW's Sam and Dean Winchester series. Um, like, like just, it's just like Sam and Dean are out there and that's what it looks like to me. And it just does not make me go, this is about, it doesn't make me say, first of all, urban fantasy. It does not even come close to even look like urban fantasy. Uh, and like I say, it's almost like, you know, a, a romance novel with the, the guys and the big chest and stuff like that and their little flannel shirts. Uh, and I just don't get what he was going for with those covers because it does not scream magic or, you know, uh, swords, sorcery, uh, monsters, vampires. It doesn't have any of that on it. I mean, nothing, nothing. Thankfully, uh, the Oberon squirrel story does have the picture of the dog and a squirrel, if I'm not mistaken, if I do remember correctly. So that that actually kind of conveys what the story looks like. Um, but the other ones, they, they just do not stand out. I mean, like when I first, when I first bought the book, because this is back way back when I was like, Oh my God. Cause I don't return the books. Like if I get it and I don't like it, good on me for getting it bad on me for not liking it. Cause I'm not going to take away a sale from somebody. I'm just not going to do that. So I was like, well, I'll just get it. And if I don't like it, I'm not going to turn it back in, but I'll just try to find something else because I need something to feed my Dresden need. And I kept looking at that book and, and people were saying, you got to try this. You got to try this. And I was like, nah, I just can't do this. And I finally caved. I finally caved and loved it. And I think you will too. Uh, this for me is really Daniel's defining moment. This is definitive series that no one else is ever going to touch this ever, you know, comparatively uh, with Daniels narrating their book. There's, there's just no way. Uh, it, it's really smart and it's witty and he plays it perfectly, perfectly. Uh, it'll take a, a lot to get him to top this, you know, this line, this series. So I highly recommend a series if you're a fan of you know, urban fantasy, fantasy in general, just great storytelling, amazing characters, and original magic systems. Because it does have a pretty original magic system. Uh, the only thing I'm going to say, sadly, is I'm not going to give you a score. I'm not. Um, I don't do that for what else have they done. This is for me to introduce you to other books. I think you get that I like it. I, I would hope. I would hope you would think that. Uh, and that I really highly, highly, highly recommend it. So, you know... Um, Go out and give it a try. Don't let those things like the cover scare you. Uh, you know, don't let the title, The Iron Druid, scare you. Uh, it, it will work. It is It is really, really good, and I'm very happy with it. Whoa. I really hope that you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. There are some amazing books on today's show, and I hope that you are willing to give each one of them a try. All I can say is I had a lot of fun listening to them so that I know that you will too. So I guess all I have to say is thanks so very much for watching, everyone. I really do appreciate you taking the time to watch or listen to the show. And again, as I always say, if you want to support us, you can always like the Lit RPG podcast Facebook page or the YouTube page or just share and like the video. I sincerely hope you've enjoyed the show. Please, please leave comments or suggestions below. 
and feel free to tell me whatever you like. I enjoy the feedback. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. Remember, please leave a review for any book that you've listened to or read. Authors really depend on those reviews. As an example, I know Katie Hanna was just one review shy of having 100 reviews for her first book, the Somnia Online series. So you get those out there and do it for them, and it helps them make more books for you in the future. For the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast, I am Ray. Keep listening.